Good morning, everyone. It's still almost morning. It's just a few minutes after 12. Our services run a tad bit longer than some other services, but we're going to be over in Galatians chapter 5, looking right around verse 22 uh, for the message today. Years ago, the Lord gave me this message, and it's a long message. It's, it's one that comfortably fits into a two-hour format, which we don't have this morning. So this is, it's, not, it's not an abbreviated version, but it's just, I, there's just some verses of Scripture I won't be able to go into. But I want to talk about the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of the devil. Because we know in Galatians 5 that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, goodness, temperance, and meekness. Now, I use the King James. And I, it doesn't bother me that people use other versions of the Bible. It, it's a topic that, and I, I thank the Lord that I never really um, got dragged into the debate between the different Bibles. I, I mean, I, I think the King James is the closest to the original, but some other people get a better understanding from other Bibles. That's fine with me. I, I would rather see somebody read a Bible that may be a little bit different from the King James than not read a Bible at all. So uh, I'm fine with that. But in this particular message, the King James is best because words mean things. You know, words, words have meaning behind them. They have depth. Uh, they have very specific, you know, there's an old saying, the Greeks had a word for everything. Well, they did. Their language was, was very extensive. And... Since the New Testament is written in the Greek, we see these words that have very specific meanings uh, they do for us in our Christianity also. A good example of this is, is over, you don't have to turn here, but over in 1 Peter, Peter uh, chapter 1, he says that we receive the end of our faith, the results of our faith is, is um, how does Peter puts it, um, we receive the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls. Well, the soul doesn't get saved. The spirit gets saved. That's John chapter 3. What, what, what Peter is talking about there, that word salvation, there's two words for, the, for uh, there's two definitions uh, for the word salvation. One comes from the Greek word sozo, which talks about our eternal security. Another one comes from the Greek word soteria, which means God's present power to deliver. Two totally different things. But the same word is translated in the King James as salvation. So words do have meanings, and we need to find out what these are sometimes. So we have the fruit of the devil, which, which is talked about over in, uh, I guess we could start in verse, uh, let's, let's start in verse 16 of, of chapter 5 of Galatians. Paul writes, he says, This I say then, that walk. It means to stand, to stand for something. To, you know, fellas, we know, we know how easy it is to be an armchair quarterback. You ever hear that term? That's, you know, for the guys that sit around and watch, watch football games. Oh, I would have done that, and oh, I would have thrown it here, and did you see that other guy that was open? And they all, they're all sitting in their chair, you know, barking at the TV about what they would have done. When if they were on the field, they would have been crushed, you know, and probably never able to get up again. But those are called armchair quarterbacks. And it's easy to sit in a church and say, well, this is the way things should be done, or that's the way things should be done. And people don't get involved. They just, they just talk, and, and they don't get involved. And, and so Paul, he says, this I say then, stand, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Isn't that not the answer for everything? If we could just stand where we're supposed to stand and not let the flesh run over us, we wouldn't, we wouldn't probably need the rest of the Word of God. So this is how important it is. Paul says, stand, walk. Okay? There's, there's you know, you just, Christianity, you know, and then they start laying down and, and no, 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 no. God wants active Christians, proactive. I mean, you know, when we got saved, now you, you might think differently, but you know, God didn't suck our brain out of our head. 
He left us with our brain because he wants us to think. He wants us to think about what his word says. Do you know this Bible tells us how to feel? It tells us how to look at different situations. It tells us how to think about different situations. See, that's why it's, for Christianity to be one, we have to be one with the Word of God. We've got to know what the Word of God is saying. So Paul is saying that we need to stand in the flesh, walk in the flesh, and we will not fulfill, uh, I mean, sorry, walk in the Spirit, and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, both are contrary. You know what the word contrary is? 180. You know, in a big circle is 360. What's half of that circle? 180. You're contrary. It's the antithesis, the opposite of what, of, of what the other part is. And so we're to the spirit lusts against the flesh. I'm sorry, the, the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are uh, contrary, or what it says in the Greek, adversarial. You know what it means to have an adversary? An opponent. These are adversarial things, the flesh and the spirit, to one the other, so that we can't do the things that we want to do. Oh, well, that tells us a lot. So we've got this battle going on between our flesh and the spirit. He says, because if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. He says, now the works... The results of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication. And I don't have time, again, in, in the longer part of the message, I can go into the details of this. this we, get, we get our words, pornography and pornea, and, and different explanations of, of different things that are going on today. But uh, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, means to be without restraint. Uh, idolatry, uh, image worship, witchcraft, hatred, variance. Variance. Variance are people who just they, just, they just have to be in an argument with somebody. Well, you know, I think it's warm today. Well, you know, it's not really that warm. You know, it's just, you know, and just, really? I mean, can, you, can we ever agree on anything? Is there always, does there always have to be, and we find this in marriages a lot too. You know, instead of marriages completing each other, they, 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 they compete. You know, well, you know, I, I think we ought to do this. Well, I think so too, but I, we need to do this too. You know, and it's like an old school teacher. You know, you ever be in school, this, this happened to me all the time, you know. Michael, what's the answer? You know, I almost never had the answer, but if I had, I'd give the answer, and the school teacher would say, yes, but blah, 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 and give, uh, give a better explanation. See, my answer was never good enough. And that's what happens when we start competing with each other. It's because the other doesn't feel you know, that, that the other is good enough. And so these variances come in. Emulations, wrath, strife. This is verse 20 of Galatians 5. Seditions. Ah, oh, seditions. Good golly. The little, the little snake. You know, the sedition. It just, it just runs through. It's people who are just sitting there going, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. And they get it with other people too. And they, it's sedition. It just, it just so quietly, like a snake, just slithers around the church seeing who else they can gobble up. Sedition, in churches, sedition is just, it's so many seditions in church. Heresies. To, be, to have a heresy, you have to be a heretic. So, oh, I'm not a heretic. Well, a heretic, by the Greek, is somebody who, is, who wants to be or has a desire to be a part of the whole, but is going to go in a different direction. Well, what happens if you're part of the whole and you go in a different direction? You fragment the whole. You can't, you can't be whole if you want to go in a different direction. You can be a nice person. You can be sweet, kind, loving. You, know, you can have friends and all kinds of people around you. You can still be the biggest heretic the church has ever seen. And so it goes on. Envies. Oh, Envies, you know, because this is jealousy. Jealousy will... You know, jealousy will guard. You know, Scripture says that God is a jealous God. And that's because God guards what is His. He stands over what is His, 
and he guards it. He's a, he's a jealous God. Envy, and the scripture never says that God is an envious God, because envy is on the bottom, clawing, doing what it can to get what it won't do for itself. What you've done, somebody else wants, it wants your glory. All, all the work that you, you've produced, all the help that you've done, they, they attach themselves to you because they, like, like leeches, they just you know, suck the life out of you. And this is what happens in many, many churches today. Envy. And, and why, why do people envy in church? Because they won't do the work that others are doing. It, it's, it's the eternal... What, I was talking with somebody earlier today, and this is the biggest problem in churches today, is that the 10% do, out of, out of the whole, 10% do what the 90 should be helping with. The 90% just stand there and they envy. They envy, oh, oh yeah, what a great church. Now, what do you do in the church? Uh, <clears throat> moving on. Murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you, before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, oh, here we go, the fruit of the Spirit. This is so important for us as Christians because this, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get riled up and, and somebody will have an, an issue with me or I might have an issue with somebody. And the problem comes up is that they demand that I be a Christian. Okay, they have a right to demand that. But they don't have to be. They can say what they want. They can slander. They can lie. You, you know, I had a situation not too long ago where, where somebody, right, right, right up front, right, right up front, just, just makes this accusation um, against somebody. You know? And, and I, I was shocked. I didn't know anything about it. And they, they were telling me, and, and I thought, well, you know, if you're right, you know, we've got to do something about this. And, and they went and told many other people in the church. I went and investigated the situation, and that person didn't say that thing. They, they didn't say it. And that person didn't go back to the people in this church and tell them they were wrong. And this accusation was made against a pastor, a visiting pastor. Wow. Wow. That person's not here anymore. You can't demand that, that other people be Christians and you don't have to be one. You know, when we do something, we're responsible for the words we use. And in the Word of God, when the Scripture says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, oh, we all love, baloney, anywhere you slice it. Joy, oh, I'm so joyful. You liar, you don't have a bit of joy in your, in your body. I mean, truth, truth be told. You know, these things can happen to me. They do happen to me, by the way. They happen to other people. And so we're going to look at some of these definitions in the time frame that we have uh, so, we don't get, so we don't get sidetracked. It says, because what the devil does, this mic is okay, what the devil does, you know, if there's a real, there's a counterfeit. Okay? Because if there's, if there's one side, there's another side. There's an antithesis to that. And the devil is so good at counterfeiting Christianity. Because we think if we're just good people, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people that, that in, in the definition of good are, are gooder, I know that's not a real word, are gooder than I am, and they're lost as a goose in a tornado, and they don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And, you know, you can be good and still not make it to heaven. Wow. You, 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 can, you can emulate. See, in America, you know, it's, it's nice to teach your children morals. You know, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. Being polite. These are, these are, these are, door, these are we do this because these open doors that nothing else would open up in our life. But yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Yeah, no, sir, yes, sir, does not get us to heaven. It just, on earth, makes things a little bit easier for us. And so the devil has counterfeited the fruit of the Spirit. And so many today, because churches, because... One more time.
because pulpits are filled with people who shouldn't be in them. And, and churches are stuffed to the rafters with unsaved people, with people who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I'll explain that at the end of the message. That, that the pulpits are silent, you know. I mean, it's like, well, I'm trying to be good. Well, I understand that. I'm, you know, I try to be good too. But truth be told, that, you know, I fail all the time. What, what, what is it that Jesus Christ has done for us? So let's look at the first one. See, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Now, what, what, what would the devil have to do to counterfeit love? You say, lust. No, no, that, that's, not, that's not the opposite of love. Good works. See, because we love, you know, no man, greater, love, greater love had no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his brother or, or sister. However that works. You know, that we would give our lives. That, that's the greatest love. Love the Lord our God with all of our hearts. So, so love is about what we do in our Christianity. And so what does the devil do? He says, well, you can't have love because, see, love has no boundaries to it. Do you know Solomon says that, that love is as strong as death? Wow. There's nothing stronger than death. When, when we're dead, what happens? We're dead. Gone. That's it. Nothing changes. So love is as, it's not stronger than death. But love is as strong as death. And so love is something that gives. And it gives and it gives. The word agape is a new, somewhat of a new word in, in Bible, not, not in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament because it describes the love of our Savior as he has for us. And, and this kind of love is a love that gives and expects nothing back. It, do, it doesn't, want, doesn't want anything, doesn't desire anything. It gives because it's supposed to give. You know, like, like the story of the, of the servant who went to his master and said, Master, I want you to serve me today. The master says, I, I, know, I know these words are, you know, these Old Testament, or I'm sorry, these old time words. He went to his boss and said, Hey, boss, he says, I want you to take care of me today. And the boss said, uh, no, that's not the deal. The deal is for you to take care of me. And, and Jesus is telling this story. And it goes on to say that this man then thought about that and was like, you know, what am I thinking? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll go ahead and take care of the boss. So he did. He went and he took care of the boss. And after that, Jesus asked a really interesting question. He said, do you think that man was blessed for what he did? See, in our society, I mean, we give trophies to people who are in last place. Everybody's a winner, except they're not a winner. You know, it never hurt my feeling when I was on a little league team and we were in last place. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really care. <laughs> I just want to play baseball. You know, I mean, everybody's like, oh, you know, and, and that's why teachers can't use red pen today because, because it, it, might, it might negatively affect the child because red is so negative. What? We're laughing, but it's true. True, you can't correct in red pen anymore because the child might get all offended. Offend them. They're a little mind, they'll be fine. Weren't we? <laughs> I don't know, you know, I'm looking around. Maybe I should look in the mirror. But maybe I didn't turn out okay, but it looks like everybody else turned out okay with the red pen. And, and where was I? Um, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. I got out on a free limb and I just sawed myself off on the wrong side. Um, this love that I'm talking about, uh, it, I'm talking about, um, yeah, oh, thank you. I'm finishing up the story of the servant. Thank you. So Jesus said, do you think that servant was blessed for what he did? Well, I would think, yeah, because why? He did the right thing. Jesus said, no, he wasn't blessed. Why? Why? Anybody? He did what he was supposed to do. This is our Savior. You know, this, 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 this esoteric, ah, oh, ah, oh, Jesus that's out there that, oh, he just cares for everybody. He does care for everybody. But he's a real man. And, and, Ladies, he's, he's the most gentle gentleman you'll ever meet. He, 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 and, and ladies, he'll treat you like a lady. 
He'll treat you like you should be treated, with, with honor and respect, ne- never dealing from the bottom of the deck. You know, this is the Savior that we serve, but he's serious about the things that he says and he does. He doesn't say so. You know, it, it's, it's like a dad who says, you know, or, or the mom, you know, when your dad gets home, you're going to get disciplined. When you, da- you know, I'm, we're going to spank you when you get home. And they get home and you never spank. Well, the kid, you think that, you think the kid's ever going to learn? No, the child's not going to learn because the child's going to continue to do. Why? Because you won't man up. Because you talk and you talk and you talk. And the kid knows that your talk is just nothing. But that's not our Savior. Jesus said, Jesus said, this man wasn't blessed because he did what he was supposed to do. We do the right thing. Why, Hegwish? Because it's the right thing to do. It's not always the nicest thing. It's not always the easiest thing. But it's the right thing. See, that's where love comes in. But what the devil does with this love is he counterfeits it with good works. So the fruit of the Spirit is good works. You just have to do good. Well, the Bible says that no flesh shall, shall manifest itself in God's eyes. You know, you know, there's not one thing that you can do, not church attendance, not tithing, not, not praising the Lord. There's not one thing that you can do in your flesh to please the Lord, which required of a steward that we be found what? Faithful. Faithful. That's what, this is what's so hard. Christianity is so easy. Christianity is so easy. The churches make it so hard for people to be Christians today. They put all these rules and regulations on what you have to do and what you have to be and, and your attendance at the church and what you do here and what you do here. And all this stuff is, like, oh, you're a Christian. You're a good Christian. You're a bad Christian. Listen, I'm, all of us, all of us, there's not one of us here that has earned eternal life. We're all, we're all lost like gooses in a tornado. But because of God's grace, we're going to heaven. See, you know, well, Pastor, you know, yeah, yeah win the pastor over. Just get on his side. You know, but I agree. I, you, know, you deserve this. So you know what I deserve? I deserve hellfire. I don't deserve anything other than hellfire. But I'm getting eternal life through Jesus Christ. So what the devil does is the fruit of the Spirit is not love because, see, love never stops. Love, love does not get boxed in by the way we feel, how we are that day, if, whether it's raining or... Because you know when it's raining, it's too bad to go to church. When it's sunny, it's too good to go to church. So, so why go? See, love isn't constrained by those things. Love, you know, why? Because, because 3 John tells us, God is love. See, and if we have God in our lives through Jesus Christ then that love, we can go on. And listen, I hurt like everybody else does. I understand. It's not easy sometimes to love somebody who doesn't love you back. But if we can be that example, let, let others watch us, you know, by the love we show to one another. Greater love had, had no man than this than we laid on our lives for our friends. Wow. You know, and that means that we endure See, good works doesn't endure. Good works is a temporary thing because we don't always do good works, even as Christians. But because of Jesus Christ today, we do good works. Because of him, not, 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 that, we, not that he and I have done this. He does this now through us. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, but the devil counterfeits it with good works. The next one is joy. You know, the joy of the Lord is my strength, the Bible says. You know, and joy. Now, when Paul was dumped into the Mediterranean for, for a day and a half, and he was, he was like a fishing bobber, up and down, because they threw him off the ship. You, you think he was happy? See, because that's the counterfeit of joy, is happiness. You know, anybody who's ever watched, you know, those, those duck guys, happy, happy, happy. Everything, everything is happy, except for one thing about happiness. Happiness is an emotion that we can have or not have. It comes, it goes. We can be happy one minute and sad the next. You know, we, we can be happy that the Lord's doing this in our lives, and then, you know, ten minutes later, we can be not happy because we don't know where the Lord is anymore. But you see, joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so joy is an emotion, I'm sorry, joy 
joy is an attribute of Jesus Christ. It's an office. It's a part of. However you want to carve Jesus up for your life, part of that carving is going to be joy. But happiness is something, the Lord, I'm convinced, and please don't misunderstand me when I say it, but I'm convinced that the Lord could care less if we're happy. He wants us to be obedient, not happy. And if we're obedient, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't, you know, I mean, the things that people say about us, you know, if I know it's not true, it's okay. I may not like it. But it's okay. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. As long as the Lord knows. That's all that really matters. And I know, I know that's easy to say. But you see, happiness, it can go in a, in a heartbeat. Somebody could say something about us, and also we're not happy anymore. We're mad. Okay, so the devil counterfeits joy with happiness. The next one is peace. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. Oh, yeah, so we have all these movements out today to make you tranquil. Yes. And, and you know, you can get into your inner self. And, 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 oh, yes, you know, you just wrap yourself up. Man, if I wrap myself up into myself, oh, man, you talk about a bad package. <laughs> That's not going to work. You know, I, I'm, I'm turmoiling sometimes on the inside. I, I, I'm not, you know, if I'm not walking with the Lord, if I don't have Jesus Christ in the front of me, I, I'm, I'm a wretched person. You know, my thoughts are all over the place. I got, I've got to repent and, and, you know. So the fruit of the Spirit is peace. But the church wants you to be tranquil, okay? We, we have these self-help programs and these books. You know, I, I have facilitated, I have been through, I, 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 I really should count them because I don't even know what the count is. I've been through many courses of anger management. Not for me. I went with somebody. And they, they repeated the class 10, 15 times. And I went. And I facilitated. I've got the books in my office. <laughs> wow, you talk about a, a, a piece of garbage of anger management. You know, it's just it's some Bible verses, which you can read in the Bible if you want. You know, you can pick up your Bible, and it'll tell you the same thing. You know, the anger man, these self-help programs don't work. Okay? The Lord gives us peace. Okay? He is the prince of what? Peace. Okay? He doesn't make us tranquil. Oh, you know, because everybody's okay. Because, you know, everybody's not okay. You know, I'm okay, you're okay. Uh-uh. I may be okay, but you're not. Or you may be okay, but I'm not. That's the truth of the matter. We're not always okay. And so tranquility is something that you're, you know, well, here, you know, we don't know what to do. And so the pastor says, well, go and go in here. Listen, I know this counseling organization and, you know, and if the counselor can't counsel you down, then they give you medication. And they put you on medication. I say that Jesus has a better answer for us. I'm not saying it's wrong to be on medication. I'm saying that Jesus has a better answer for us. If, you have to, if you're on medication, if you have to be on medication, you stay on your medication. But I think Jesus has a better answer, and he'll show you. And if you ever need to get off that, he'll show you how to get off your medication. Thousands have. Thousands have gotten off their medication. It brings, you got to bring deliverance into the picture. I mean, what do pastors, what do, pastors do? Here, you have, you have a devil, a real devil. This, this real thing, okay, this real guy who, who you know, he's not, he doesn't just have the cape and the horn, <laughs> you know, and the, and the pitchfork, and <laughs> I'm a, a mistake. This guy hates you. He hates your children. He hates your family. He hates anything good in your life. And he, he doesn't just want you dead. He wants you to suffer on the way to your death. He, wa he wants your children to suffer. He wants you on drugs. He wants you in an institution. He wants you to be mentally unstable. This is all before you die. This is how much the devil hates you. And you know why he hates you so much? Because in the garden, wh when Adam and Eve sinned, God came to Adam, offered him grace. He came to Eve, offered her grace. Came to the serpent, <laughs> judged him. No grace. The serpent was judged. And he doesn't get a second chance. 
And this is the only way that the devil can get back at God for not giving him grace like he did Adam and Eve is to get us. And he hates us. And he does everything he can to destroy anything good in our lives that has come from the Lord. So the next, the next quality, the next part of Jesus that we're to have in our life is long-suffering. Was not our Savior long-suffering? When he was reviled, he didn't revile back. How about us? When people say bad about us, do we have to shoot back? See, and so, so the counterfeit to long-suffering is tolerance. We tolerate people. You know, but only so far. We'll only tolerate so far. Because, you know, we'll go this far and no further. But you see, long-suffering goes forever. It's a quality of Jesus Christ. Because our Savior did, we can also. But when the church teaches, well, you know, you, you just have to put up with it so far, well, what does that mean? Well, you finally have to stand up for yourself. Well, what if you're wrong? Well, see, everybody, well, I'm right. Well, see, there we get into those verses over in Proverbs. It says, there's a way that seems right unto man, but the ends thereof are the ways of destruction. We all think we're right or we wouldn't do things. But a lot of times we're wrong. And so what the devil does with, with, with long-suffering is, is he puts this, you know, this imitation on there of tolerance. You know, I'm only going to tolerate people so much. And you know what? If this is not evident in the church today, you know, with all the social issues we have going on in the world, you know, because, because you know, we've got, we have blacks here and whites here. We have Hispanics here. Uh, we may have other, other, we have other races that are here. And do you know that if you're born again, we're one in Christ? Do you know that your life is supposed to be behind you, your past? And how much of your past is in your present? How much of your past is in your present right now? Well, you just don't know what they did to me. I don't, but our Savior does. And Paul says all this stuff that he had, all this stuff that he learned, everything that he was, he not only put them behind him, he, he went one step further. He put it behind him, and then he said, this is, this is what I think of it. He says, it's dung. Because now we're all one in Christ. And we're to act the same. We're to think the same. Well, you just don't know about my ancestry. I don't. But you don't know about mine either. Well, I read a book. Well, I read a book too. And do you see where the division comes in? See, now we, instead of, instead of, the, instead of the body being whole, the body's not whole. The body's split here. We have one group over here. We have another group over here that doesn't understand this group over here. And then this one splinters over here because it understands this group but not this one over here. And over here. So then we got this one over here because it understands this with this. With, you know? And we have all these factions in the church when the Bible tells us we're one in Christ and we need to think the same. We need to treat everybody the same. And how do we treat people? The way we want to be treated. We don't treat people special. We treat people the way we would want ourselves treated. See, that's what being a Christian is. It's not, not these rules and regulations. Who wants to be treated mean? Well, nobody. Okay, well then we don't treat people mean then. How many want to be dealt from the bottom of the deck? Anybody tired of being dealt from the bottom of the deck? I am. I'm getting tired of trying to figure people out sometimes. You know, just, you know, I always say Christianity is a come as you are party. You know, just don't try and be something different. Be who you are. Well, people don't like me. Well, the Lord will change you. It's okay. So we see that, uh, to you know, tolerance, you know, you only put up with so much. Uh, the, the next part of the fruit is gentleness. Now, Again, our Savior is the best example of what gentleness could ever be. And the devil, he counterfeits. Counterfe By the way, these counterfeits, they're not bad in the flesh. They just won't get us to heaven. Because how do you counterfeit gentleness? Manners. Of course, manners. You teach people what's right and what's wrong. How to, that, that, what is it that... Uh, that the fork goes with the, with the knife, I believe, and the spoon is by itself, and, and you know, how you set a table, and how you, how you hold a cup, and, and you may call that etiquette, but manners. You know, that, you know, you want to you wanna be nice, so to speak, in front of people, but you see, manners, like everything else that I've been talking about, only go so far. I mean, after a while, you know, if, if there's no silverware on the table, the manners kind of go by the wayside and, and so does everything else and we'll start picking up our food with our hands. 
Well, that's not, that's not very manly. Well, I'm hungry. Well, I understand, but you, know, you shouldn't eat with your hands. You should, well, don't tell me how to eat. Judge not, let's be judged. No problem. Okay? But if we have, if we have, if we're gentle, see, our, our Savior was gentle in all things. And gentleness is, is how we, you know, our souls, um, you know, there's a war. The Bible says there's a war for our soul. And our soul is how we think, how we feel, and how we act or how we react. And, and this is where gentleness comes in because it helps buffer how we react to things. If we're, if we're gentle in all things, it, and it doesn't mean that we're a mealy mouth. It just means that we're not aggressive in things. But it's, you know, it's okay to be aggressive because, you know, there just comes a time when you just have to be aggressive. Yes, but manners won't get you to heaven. See, these are, these are all things. We, we, can't, we can't put on love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. We can't put these things on. Why? Because these are attributes of Jesus Christ. We can put on the best we can put on our good works and happiness and tranquility and tolerance and have manners. And how about the next one? Goodness. The next one is goodness. You, you, know, you know what the devil does to counterfeit goodness? With morals. We teach our children what's right and wrong. We, we teach them. You know, we don't leave, you know, Hal Moore, Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore, who um, uh, in 1965 led the first, led the first set of platoon. Now, he wasn't a platoon. It was probably a, half a battalion in Vietnam, um, into, um, I forget the place where they were. He was the first one on the field. He was the last one off the field. And he had morals. And no man is going to be left behind. It's, you know, because a lot of countries, they leave their dead behind. They don't care. They're dead. Where they lay is where they lay. You know, we, we don't leave our, our dead behind. I was in the Marine Corps. We never left any, you know, nobody, left, nobody gets left behind. You know, dead or alive, people always, you know, people for the most part, t until the government gets involved, <laughs> um, you know, everybody, everybody comes home. But morals is something we teach our children. I hope, I hope you teach your children morals. You te because it's teaching them what's right and wrong. But you see, morals don't get us to heaven. Goodness does because it's part of our Savior. And morals will only go so far also. Real quick, because I'm going to be running out of time here pretty quick. The next one is faith. Wow, what a great quality. Of, you, know, you know, we're given a measure of faith when we believe, because we don't have any faith. In fact, the faith that you have, you know, it is by grace we are saved through faith. That faith is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Lest any of us should say, hey, man, me and God, we got this thing going, and I'm going to heaven because I'm, you know, me and God are friends. No, it doesn't work that way. God gives us a measure of faith to believe. Now, that faith is part of Jesus Christ. Now, he gives us enough faith to get home. It's what we do with that faith after we get it. Do we, do we build or exercise our faith? So what is, what is the counterfeit of faith? Loyalty. Loyalty. Oh, yeah, I'm for the pastor. Well, I don't know. You know, he's this, that, and he, he may well be, by the way. But we, we, we get loyal to those around us when if we're following our Savior, then we're doing the right thing in our faith. A, a good example. See, it, this implies steadiness, but it's not, it's, steadiness is not faith. You know, faith, again, it's the substance of, of things hoped for, a desire to have something, and then knowing the evidence of having this without having it in front of you. That's faith. See, steadiness is similar to faith, but it's not. And I'm steady in the church, and I come all the time, and I do this and that, and I help out, and all these things. And there are a lot of people, do you know a lot of people are going to slide to hell from a church pew? A lot of people are going to slide to hell from a church pew. And they think they've got faith and what they have is steadiness. They're steady in the church. Boy, they're a rock. Look at, look at that person. They never miss church even when they're sick. Listen, when you're sick, stay home. Amen. Okay? <laughs> when you're sick, stay home so you don't make the rest of us sick. <laughs> well, how, how are you going to get prayer? You can get prayer at home. You don't have to come to church to get prayer. You, you, your empatigo and, and your pink eye. And please, please, <laughs> leave, leave that stuff at home. We, we don't need that stuff in the church. 
And if you got other creepy crawlers on you, man, stay home. <laughs> you know, do, do something about that. So faith, faith implies steadiness, but faith is not steadiness. And so the devil, the devil, he raises up these people who are like, they're, they're like a rock. Well, look, that person, they're always on time. And, and I could follow that person because they're always saying the right thing and they're always doing the right thing in front of you. But you never know what's going on behind a closed door. That's the one thing about our Christianity. That's why James tells us if we look into the, into the, the perfect, the mirror of our lives, you know, we, we go before the mirror and we're like, oh, I'm, I'm that bad? And we step away and go, I'm not that bad. What are you talking about? And we step in front of the mirror and we're like, oh, what was that thing? We step away from the mirror and we're like, hey, I'm not that bad. Because when we're in front of the mirror, we see our imperfections. But when we step away, we don't have imperfections. What, what, what imperfections? You know, ears down here, you know, the nose is crooked and the mouth, you know, halfway over here. And hey, it's just the way we are. We're all we're all imperfect in some way. But we have to stand before the mirror of our lives and and know who we are. And when we get behind a closed door sometime, brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, I've met some godly, godly men and women in my time. I've traveled the world and I, I've I've seen and met missionaries and 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 you know, people that are that are doing things that you know, we never even thought of here in the church and, and good things. And, and I found out one thing, that we all are infallible people, that we all have problems, we all have issues, we all have things that are going on that, that we need to work on, that none of us have arrived. Paul never arrived. Even towards the end of his life, he says, I've not, I've not even come close to arriving. And how many Christians think they, they have? But So the devil counterfeits faith with with loyalty or, or with steadiness. And then real quick, we've got two left here. Meekness. Our Lord and Savior was meek, not weak. Meekness does not imply weakness. Okay? But but the counterfeit of meekness is passivity. You know, so so when an issue comes, because it's funny that our Lord could be so meek. Yeah, you know, it's it's like it's like the Apostle John. He, they call him the apostle, the apostle of love. Yeah, the apostle, of John, the apostle of love. I, I wonder, if, I wonder if Diatres felt that love. When over in three John, John, John says, "And Diatres, I'll take care of him when I get there." All the error and keeping people out of the church, he says, "I'll take care of that when I get there." He was saying that you know, so much for this apostle of love. He was going to nail this guy for keeping people out of the church and for the rebellion that was going on. And, and you know, so we see people in, in different lights, and to, have, to be meek means that there can be a situation that we don't have to get all up in arms about. But we don't turn passive, because that's what a lot of people in church, well, you know, they just, they, they, they just start zoning out. <laughs> Having a lot in their worship music too, but they just start zoning out and... and and I mean, some will even they'll go into altered state of consciousness, and they'll just they'll think that well, by not dealing with something, well, we can deal with something, but not we don't always have to have a big stick or a big club in our hands. Meekness, why? Because we can do the same. We can have the same problem in our life, but we but the counterfeit of meekness is passivity. And the last one, for the for the sake of time and. One of these days I'd like to give this message again with, with, in the long version because there's so many verses that back up all the stuff that I'm talking about. Is temperance. Got to be temperance. Oh, you know what, brothers and sisters, you know what it means to temper something? Uh, I remember in shop class, you know, we were making a screwdriver and, and uh, then you had to heat it up. Once, once, once you formed it from the steel, you had to heat it up. But if you heated it too much, it became too, too brittle. And so when you went to apply pressure, it would just shatter. And if you didn't put enough heat there, if you didn't temper it enough, it would bend. But there was a, there was a right way. And then this other job I had, to, uh, I don't know, they called it a rock wall test. And what you did is you took this meter and you put it on the steel and it would, and it would tell you what the temperance of the steel is. So if you, because some steel you could, it was just snap and break. 
Some would just bend over real easy. But you need to have temperance. And so, so the devil comes along and says, you know, because temperance helps us to deal with every issue on its own merits. You know, we don't take one person's problems and then the next week when the person says, well, I've got this going on, and you take that problem and you lump it in, uh, every issue on its own merits. And, and what, te- what temperance will do for us, um, it, it, it helps us to be real, you know, with one another. Um, real quick. Um, the counterfeit of, t- of temperance is self-restraint. I'm holding myself back. Well, how long can we hold ourselves back from something? Not long in my... <laughs> not, you know, I start thinking about something, I'm just like, all right, bring it on. <laughs> you know, let, let's deal with it. You know, again, these are all works of the flesh. All these imitations are works of the flesh. Are they good to have in our lives? Yes, they are. But they don't get us to heaven. What gets us to heaven is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, goodness, temperance, meekness. I thought there was nine. Well, maybe I got an extra finger on my hand. You'll have to pray for me if I do. These are the things we've got to have. See, and what do Christians produce? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith. We don't produce these other things. These other things may be good in us to a certain extent, but as Christians, why? Because everybody has the same problems we have. When we start judging or looking down our nose towards people, that's why we don't have to judge anybody. The Word of God already judges us. I don't have to to look at somebody and say, hey, you're you're a sinner, you know? Get behind my door every once in a while. Once in a while. Hardly at all. Maybe never, kind of, sort of. Let's move on. You know, when we look at ourselves, we see that, that we have issues and problems. Just know that everybody else does too. And how do we want to be treated? With respect. With restraint. We want people to have temperance with. Would you please have some temperance with me? You know, just, just you know, don't, don't be so hard you know, that, that, I, that I can't do anything or that I'm too judgmental and don't be so soft that the pastor never says anything. You know, in the middle there, there's an answer. And as Christians, you know, Paul had to, all these different people that he had to, he, that he had to deal with, leaders and, and, and followers and, and, you know, people who didn't have anything, didn't know anything, people who did have things. And, and you, you make yourselves, as the Word of God says, you become all things to all people. It doesn't mean you become a sinner to sinners. But you become all things to all people. Why? Because that's how we win Christ. That's how we bring people to our Lord. And I want to mention this just as, as I'm closing. This Jesus that I've been talking about, he tells us in, in his word, he says, taste me and see that I'm good. He says, just check me out. Now, he says, you know, we've got to do it honestly. You just can't. Uh, I mentioned at a church we have a lot of visitors today that uh, I used to have this, this driver that drove me to an airport. I got to know him after a couple of years and and he was fairly faithful, so I would call him. And, and, you know, he, and he was a um, Jehovah Witness. Actually, he was a backslidden Jehovah Witness, whatever that means. And uh, so we would, we would talk, and, and I, mean, I, knew, I knew that he was this close to accepting Christ as, as Savior. And then one day he just he kind of threw me. He says, unless Jesus appears in my front seat, he says, he says I won't accept him. And I said, you'll never accept him then because he's not, he's not going to, you know, kowtow. He's not going to, you know, woo you or, you know. I said, I've told you everything that the Word of God says. You, you know what the Word of God says, but he, he wouldn't budge. That's not the kind of testing I mean. If, you, if, if the message today or if Jesus has been flagging you, it's because he wants to talk to you. And all you have to say is, here I am, Lord. Help, help me. Show me. Lord, show me that you're real. Show me, show me that you're really this and not this. Because maybe you've been turned off by religion. I would be. 
I, I can understand why a lot of people don't go to some churches. I wouldn't want to go to their churches either. Just phony baloney stuff that nothing going on, a lot of sham, a lot of, a lot of loud music. And, you know, isn't it funny that, that, uh, that uh, when Elijah was on the mountaintop and, and the tornado came, the winds came, boom! The Lord wasn't in that. And when the fire came against the mountain, boom! He wasn't in that. What was he in? The still, small voice. It's not about how big and loud things are. It's about how real they are. And the Lord is real. And if you've never asked him to come into your life to save you from your sins, it, you'll make a lot of decisions in your life. But you'll never make a more important decision than that. To make him Lord and Savior. You say, well, how, how do I do that? Well, do I have to sign something? No. All I have to do is say, pray something like this. Lord Jesus, if I've never asked you into my heart or my life before, I'm asking you here and now, come into my heart. Come into my life and save me from my sins. If you'll mean it, he'll mean it. He'll come in. And you can be just who you are. This is a come-as-you-are party. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to wear different clothes. You don't have to put on a, a happy face. and Just be who you are. But make sure that you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and save you from your sins because sin has separated from God. It's not a bad time. It's, it's not that we've been mean. It's not because our grandmother was this or my father was that. It's because sin has separated us from our Savior. And Jesus Christ is the only way back to God. But to have Jesus, you have to ask him in. He's, he's a door. See, we have, we have Revelation 3.20 up on the wall there. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. This door that he's talking about is a door that has a doorknob here, but not here. And Jesus, Jesus is on the other side of this door, and he can't open the door. You have to. You have to open the door and let him in. But if you'll let him in, he'll show you that he's the best thing that will ever happen to you. If you have a question about your salvation, we're going to have an invitation here in just a minute, and you can come forward, and we can sit down with you and talk to you about who the Savior is and what the Word of God has to say about him. But maybe you're driven, harassed, and tormented, and this has produced a compulsive behavior in your life which is slowing down, stopping, or turning around your Christianity. Wow, that happens to all of us. This is what demons are doing in the life of the believer. Don't worry about the, the unsaved. They're, they're just loaded with demons. Of course, Christians are too, pretty much. But Jesus gave us one remedy for evil spirits. We have it on the wall. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In his name, cast out devils. There, there's no other way to get them out. They've got to be cast out in Jesus' name. You can't wave your coat like Benny Hinn. You, know, you can't dig the imaginary hole like, like Norval Hayes and all these other guys and, and put your pretend demons in there. And well, What a bunch of foolishness. I mean, I can understand why people wouldn't want to go back to these churches. But Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In his name, cast out devils. We also believe the gifts are forte. We believe that God heals today because he says in his word, he changes not. So if you have any need whatsoever, Brother Kenny's going to be up front here handing people out. If you have a question or you want prayer today, let's stand. If you know the words of something about that name, that's our invitational song. Please feel free to yell it out or sing it out. And just come forward if you have a need today, please. Thank you.